Welcome and good evening, everyone. And thank you for being here tonight. I am Bonnie Michelle Cannon, the Executive Director of the Bridgehampton Child Care and Recreational Center, yes. Thank you all for being here. We are blessed to have this crowd here tonight as part of the Center's Thinking Forward Lecture Series. Thank you, Guild Hall, for letting us use your theater. We knew that Misty Copeland would draw too large a crowd for us to host at our place, though we do hope that all of you will take a chance to stop by and drive by Sag Harbor Turnpike. Look for the center, get to know us, don't just drive by, stop by. I am happy to have by my side Valentini Tino Carlotti, a distinguished member of the Guild Hall board and patron to Misty Copeland. Valentino was instrumental in getting us this venue here tonight. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Val, would you have a few words? Thank, thank, you, thank you so much, Bonnie. And just let me add my welcome to everyone and welcome to Bonnie and your team. Uh, and on behalf of Andrea Grover, the executive director of Guild Hall, and Marty Cohen, our chairman, and the entire board of trustees at Guild Hall, welcome here to our home. And we are so happy to have you. And of course, as Misty's sponsor and a fellow board member at ABT as well. We're so happy to have Misty here tonight. You're gonna to be in for a real treat. I'm sure you'll see why she's such a beautiful and great woman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valentino. Also, we are very pleased to have Lynn White with us tonight as a moderator. Lynn is a former TV anchor and three-time Emmy Award winner. She continues her career in television radio, journalism, and as a blogger. She is a longtime resident of the East End and no stranger to Guild Hall or to the Bridgehampton Child Care Center. In earlier years, she helped organize our summer benefit at the Elaine Benson Gallery in Bridgehampton. Thank you, Lynn, for agreeing to moderate tonight's presentation with Misty Copeland. Now, Misty Copeland is a legend, a star, a breaker of glass ceilings, a down-to-earth ballerina. When asked recently on the Today Show about her reaction to the accolades she receives, the rave reviews, the truckloads of flowers, she replied, I spend 90% of my time working my butt off. <laughs> we are so thrilled to have Misty here. Had she listened to the first ballet school she applied to at 13 who told her, you are too old. Your body isn't right for ballet. You should be a dancer in Las Vegas. She wouldn't be here tonight. Nevertheless, she persisted all the way to the top of her dream. The first woman of color to ever be named principal dancer for the American Ballet Theater. Yes. She is also a best-selling author, Broadway performer, inspirational spokeswoman for girls, fashionista with her own collection at Under Armour. She's even a Barbie doll. <laughs> we are beyond proud that Misty is here tonight as a guest of the Bridgehampton Child Care and Recreational Center. Our children dream too, and Misty is living proof that their dreams can come true. Now, we will show a short video of Misty for her new line of clothing for Under Armour. The systemic structure built to keep me in place is the stage I dance on Black and woman. Mother ships, my mother's hips be held deep space. Astronaut of corporal grace. Born in a landmine. As an idea points its toe to flex to shape the form of possibility. I am testament, twirled into afterthought the touch and taste of epiphany. To match my strength is to feel your own.
Yet like any born to blaze a trail, to sing a song and land in jail, to risk it all, to change a game, to shift the form and take its name, to follow stars when chased by dogs and potty shy to shatter norms, to solo and to feel alone, to take up space in history's home, to harbor hopes, wishes, and dreams, to bring the untold into being. The oppressor's gaze ain't all I seen. I'm unlike any. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Misty Clopin and Lynn White. Thank you everyone for waiting. Thank you Thank so you for much waiting. for being here. <laughs> and I'm sorry you went through all of that traffic, but hopefully it will be well worth it to all of us here and to you. You are such an icon and such a young, beautiful person. I know you get that everywhere you go. What is the number one question other than, if it's a man, can I marry you? Do people ask you? What is your what is your daily life like? You know, what is it what is it like to be um, to be a ballerina with American Ballet Theater and to juggle all that you do? That's probably the most. What is a typical day like for Misty Copeland? Um, yeah, it it really varies from season to season or even from week to week. Um, if I'm uh, in the bulk of my time is spent in rehearsal um, season. Uh, so that will be working Tuesday through Saturday from 10.15 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and on Mondays, on Sundays, we try and have a, a real day of rest. But on Mondays, I'm usually doing interviews or photo shoots and um, filming commercials, things like that. Not uh, your favorite things to do, right? No, I mean, no, not that I don't like doing right. it, but I would much rather be dancing. Of course you would. <laughs> and you are uh, <laughs> such a beautiful, elegant dancer. You started at an age that you say was older. You were 13 at the time. Um, and they told you that you didn't have the right body, the right look. How did you push through all of the obstacles to become you? Um, well, initially, actually, that, that um, idea of me not fitting into the ballet mold didn't come until I was a professional already. At 13, I felt like um, the sky's the limit. I'd never been given an opportunity to work towards becoming anything. Growing up in a single parent home, one of six children just struggling um, to survive. Uh, so when I was introduced to ballet at 13 years old, it was like, oh my gosh, this is, I've never been a part of something that's so beautiful and that's um, so calming and I'm learning so much and soaking it up every day. I think the obstacles then were um, adjusting to this new lifestyle, leaving home. I went to live with my ballet teacher immediately so that I could get um, kept caught up on the training. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until I was a professional four years later that I realized, oh, there aren't very many African-American dancers in the ballet world, and I was the only black woman in American Ballet Theater for 10 years. What um, was that like for you? Difficult, or just did you carry it with a sense of pride? Um, it's something that I, I learned and uh, evolved um, my pro throughout the process of, of being on my own. Um, again, initially, I was so new to the ballet world that it never even dawned on me that I was the only. Um, it took me a while to really understand that um, black dancers aren't often accepted um, and told that they have the wrong body type and that they won't fit into a corps de ballet. Um, so it was really difficult for me in the beginning. I considered leaving and, and going to another company where I would fit in more, like Dance Theater of Harlem. Um, and it was having support like that came into my life, women, strong black women that came into my life that helped to guide me and show me that it's okay to be the first. And, and you're not alone. what did alone. they say to you specifically? Don't give up? Yeah, I mean, those there. words um, that it's, you know, showing me other women that had been um, in a similar position. They weren't classical dancers, but that had uh, been the first to do whatever in their field. And, and for me, it was 
it changed, I think, the course of my career and my the way I felt about myself and um, having this confidence that I didn't know I could have by simply seeing someone who looked similar to me succeeding. Yeah. You started out um, the way a lot of people probably in our audience in the world start out, uh, kind of shy, not really knowing what your destiny would be. And then um, your mother kept marrying a different man. At the end of it, I think she was up to four in your book. Um, and that was hard for you. You had siblings, step-siblings, and you, they were different ages. And I know when any child moves from place to place, you feel like you don't belong, you're not accepted. So you must have gained the skills to be one of the crowd while you were young, going through that. And it wasn't easy. Yeah, I was really good at like disappearing um, and, and not having uh, a voice. And, and it became so much a part of me. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to stand out in any way. I didn't want to be seen. Um, I just wanted to um, blend in and, and, you know, living in such a chaotic household and moving constantly, um, it just became this comforting place for me to be. So it was really shocking to my family when they realized I loved performing. They were like, but you don't speak, uh, like you don't want to be seen. Why would you want to be on stage in front of hundreds of people? Why do you think it was that you didn't speak? I had this fear of being judged, of being criticized, of saying the wrong thing. Um, I think it was just not having a sense of home or stability ever, um, and I just felt safest if I was quiet and just not kind of rocking the boat in any way. Right. A lot of dancers say that it's a catharsis when you get up there on the stage and you're in your movement and you just get into the feeling of the beat and the rhythm of the music and the people around you. Is that kind of an escape mechanism for you from time to time? Um, yeah, I, I think initially I, don't, I didn't realize I loved performing in front of lots of people, but I knew that I loved moving. Um, and it was an escape for me from a young age, even before I started ballet. I was um, creating movement and choreographing in, in the small, like quiet place I could find wherever it was we were living. Um, and it gave me a sense of power and it gave me a voice without having to speak and it was very creative. Um, but when I stepped onto the stage for the first time, I think that was the most shocking to me that um, I felt so safe and protected. Like when you're in a ballet studio, you can, people can see you. I, I love the movement part of it, but it still was a little intimidating um, being surrounded by all of the dancers and staring at yourself in a mirror. Um, but when I got up onto the stage, and you know, it's a similar thing to this, the lights are on you and you can't see anyone. Right. And it was like, this is amazing. I'm doing what I want to do and no one can say anything to me and I can't see them. Right. And um, I just, it was this amazing feeling of freedom. Right, and you aced it everywhere you went, right? What was it like the first time you got on stage at the Met? That had to be intimidating. Um, yeah, it was, right. it was a little scary at first, but um, I think it was just because of the circumstances too. When you're thrust into a company like American Ballet Theater, um, you're often not given a lot of preparation. Right. Um, things are really moving quickly and, and you're expected to just kind of jump on the train and keep moving. Mm. Um, and so the first time I was on the Met stage, I performed... Um, one of the four swans in, in Swan Lake, which is a really big deal as um, uh, an apprentice with the company. And so I learned the choreography in a dressing room on a video tape mm. and, um, and had a couple of rehearsals and was thrown out there. Wow. So it was a little scary. <laughs> but you did it, right? You got through it. Yeah, yeah. And look at you now. It's an amazing venture and you're such an inspiration to a lot of folks out there, a lot of kids who also come from broken homes um, and, and find their own way in life, their own means of survival. You mentor, you go back to where you came from to help other kids who went through what you did. You must get a lot of uh, good feeling from that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's not something that I've ever really um, 
thought about like, oh, I'm gonna go and do this. It's just happened really organically. Um, starting out at the Boys and Girls Club um, in my hometown, that's where I first took ballet, took yeah. my first ballet class there. And uh, the sense of home that I felt there and stability for the first time before I went into the ballet world right. um, was incredible. So it was kind of like, how could I not go back there and continue a relationship with them? And um, I think also being a dancer uh, and experiencing the relationships that you build with the other dancers in the company as well as the ballet masters and ballet mistresses. And you, they're all former dancers and they're yeah. there to lend their Support. experience. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so I feel like it's kind of ingrained in us as dancers to want to lend our experience and knowledge to other dancers, younger dancers. Yeah. So I come from the TV world where we all know things are a little backbiting <laughs> behind the scenes. And we all saw the Black Swan. We know what goes on from the movies. Is it really like that in real life? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I want there to be a movie that gets it right. Yeah. Um, Starring you, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. But, um, I think the turning point got it you know, pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, but. The, the ballet community is is so much more close knit, and when you're in a company, we're so much more like family than I think people realize. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like being an an individual athlete, like an ice skater or a gymnast. You know, we're really on stage together. We spend more time with each other than we do with our families, it's traveling and effort. touring. Yeah. Yes, and so it's not as competitive in in that way um, that people assume. Um, but we really rely on, on one another. Have you ever gotten on a huge platform, a stage, and just went the wrong way or did the wrong movement? Yeah, I mean, you, when you're in live theater, things are bound things to happen. Things happen, right. Um, yeah, I actually was talking about it with someone recently. I, it had probably been since I was a teenager that I went on stage and like forgot the steps. And it happened last year um, <laughs> when we were in Paris performing and I don't know, my mind just kind of went somewhere else in the middle of, I was doing the Bluebird Padida in Sleeping Beauty, and I just forgot what to do next, and I just stood there <laughs> staring at my partner, and he was mortified, oh, no. <laughs> and he just extended his hand, and I took it, and then we just kind of figured out where to go from yeah, there. Yeah, you wing it, right? <laughs> but no one knew in the audience but my director and, of course, the choreographer. They yeah. were just kind of like, it happens. Right. And they change up on you, right? The choreographer, right before a show, a big performance, they change movements, they attune it to your body and the way that you move. Yeah, I know it's possible that something could be tweaked or changed at yeah. the last minute. It's not often. Um, with Alexei Rutmansky, who I was just, uh, he, it was his Sleeping Beauty, yeah. um, uh, with most of his ballets that are new creations, um, you know, he'll see something from the front of the house that doesn't read in the right way that he wants it to. Or um, So you have to be a blank canvas as, as, a, as a professional dancer and, and be up for the challenge of, these changes happening in the last minute, and you have to be able to just go know, for it, take right? it on, and, yeah. and perform. Now we look at you, and you're, you know, you're just the perfect, beautiful person, and it looks like everything in life after your childhood is just going up, up, up the ladder of success and joy. But even for you, there was a bit of a setback. You lost a year of your career. What was that like for you? Um, every dancer experiences um, injury. I'm yeah. definitely not the first or right. and only, um, but uh, it's it's what comes with the territory. Yeah. And um, the most severe injury that I had um, was at 29 years old, and I um, had stress fractures in my tibia, and I ended up having surgery and having a plate put in. Um, but it. The first injury that I had, I was 19, and I was actually out for a year as well. And um, I had a, another stress fracture in my lower back. But at that time, you know, I was still so new to the ballet and so young that I felt like, oh, I have a year to like experience life and you know right. learn how to drive and do all of these things. And you know, at, at 29 years old, a lot more is at stake. And um, I was still a soloist at the time, and. Um, the opportunity to become a principal dancer, that window was very, 
it was cracked open. <laughs> and, um, and so having that year away from the stage um, was really difficult in terms of the future for me at American Ballet Theater. And I think it gave me a fuel and a fire to get back onto the stage and, and f want to get back and be better than when I left. And so I feel like it, if I didn't have this injury, I don't know where I would be. Yeah, God bless. In the meantime, you also talk in your book about eating and eating habits and how to change habits that might be bad, that, that don't suit you. And you tell your readers to do you, be you, do your exercises, eat the way that you do, but do them the way the individual wants to do them. And I, I thought that it was interesting, you talk about fat, we all think of fat as being bad for you, but you say, no, go for it, fat's good. Why? I, I think it's just an understanding of, of balance, um, uh, portion sizes and, um, and not overeating, you know? And I think that people assume that um, fat is bad, but they're just gonna binge on all of these other things that, you know, when you think of sugar or, or overeating carbs, like all of it's bad for you right. if you eat too much of it. But for me, um, I need I need that fuel. I need those healthy fats and proteins to keep me going through the day. And it's more important to get um, you know, really high um, energy and foods that are yeah. going to get me the Proteins. energy that are not kind of uh, you know chips and soda and right. things that are empty calories. Right. I loved the part of your book that talked about you, this glamorous, beautiful Misty Copeland in her apartment in New York City ordering donuts and you can't order just one, so you order the whole box and you eat the whole box of donuts. <laughs> that didn't last long. You've soon met your husband who put you on the right path to eating for life, right? And tell me about that. How did you meet him? Oh, how did I meet my husband? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> we want to get personal, right? <laughs> um, I met him out through friends yeah. when I was 21 years old. So yeah. it's been a long journey together. That's great. Yeah, and, and he taught you really how to eat well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I mean, I'd never been in a relationship, but but I'd also never really um, been. It's interesting as dancers, as professional athletes, you think that we be taught how to take care of our bodies in that way. And it was not something that I was ever um, really told how to do properly. I was just kind of thrust into the ballet world. And um, I had no idea what food I should be eating. And, um, and so he was just someone that's very healthy and takes care of himself and exercises. And so um, he was the first person that really kind of broke it down for me. And, and also was like, you're an athlete. Right. You need to you know, think of yourself in that way and treat your body, you know, with respect. Right, and you have. Um, speaking of respect, um, and one of the people that most of us out here really love and respected dearly was Prince, and you got to perform with him. What was that like? Yeah, um, it was a dream, yeah. a dream. Um, it was, besides my husband, I think that he was really the second man that came into my life that was such a positive um, influence and, and push in the right direction for me in terms of my um, creative growth and um, maturity as a woman. I feel like he, he pushed me in ways that um, no one had at American Ballet Theater. And I think also coming from, from a black man, from someone that I respected, um, that was so gifted, it made me feel even more empowered that he um, saw the potential in me to be great. What did he say? Like, do another plie? I mean, that's, I'm sure that's not what came out of Prince's mouth. How did he make you feel that? Was it just his energy? Was it the way he, he talked to you about your performances? Was it that he gave um, you that support, that pat on the back? He, well, he was very encouraging and supportive, but uh, initially uh, he gave me the freedom to just create an improv, which yeah. was a huge responsibility while he, you know, at his concerts. Um, I never had freedom like that. You don't get, you know, that type of freedom in, a, in the classical ballet world. Um, everything is very structured and prepared. And, and the first time I toured with Prince um, in France, he said, 
uh, just go on stage and create. And, I, and it was this freedom that I'd never experienced. And, and it was uh, very powerful for me. And he just encouraged me to not, not hide because I'm different. Like that's even more empowering to be an individual and take advantage of that. And like, don't be afraid to um, be different and, and, and create and not feel like you have to be like anyone else. And I feel like that was kind of how he lived his life and, and his career. Yeah, he honored the fact that you were the first in your field as he was probably one of the best in his. Um, I love that you're doing so many different things, right? You're, you're here talking to us tonight. Um, you shot the video. Um, you're, you're representing children. You go and talk to them. You uh, have your own mentors and you, you really, you've stuck with them. They've stuck with you. They've made such an impact in your own life. I'm wondering, when Misty Copeland is 10 years older, what will you be doing then, having done so much already in your life? I, it's so hard to, pre I mean, I never would have thought that I would be here five yeah. years ago um, doing what I'm doing. I feel like I try and stay open to every opportunity that comes my way, um, making the right decisions and for the right time in my life. But I know that I will never leave the ballet world completely, right. um, that I will forever be a part of it and, and having that conversation, of, you know, pushing for more diversity in, in the ballet world. and. I don't know, who knows, write more books and... Um, would you like a I family? Don't know. Yeah, I would yeah. love to. I would love to have a family. I think coming from a big family myself, that's something that um, I would love to have. Yeah, well, we are so proud of you and so Thank glad you, you made it uh, up 27 and got here. And we have a lot of people out there <laughs> As Misty said, we can't see you. <laughs> it's all dark out there. But if somebody wants to ask her a question, can you raise your hand? And we'll have someone bring you a microphone. There you are. <laughs> Questions? All right, right here. What's your name? Do you want to stand up? Yeah, you. <laughs> And the mic is coming to you. One second. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So of all of the roles that you have danced, which is your favorite and why? Um, I, OK, so I think it's probably Juliet. But I, I am still trying to find my way with Giselle. And I think it has the potential to be my favorite. Um, both of those roles are very dramatic and there's a lot of acting, um, which I've discovered um, probably over the past two years that that's a real strength of mine that I never knew I had, um, is, is becoming a character and kind of living in, in that moment throughout the course of the evening. To me, that brings me um, so much fulfillment you know, because it's more than just getting out there and doing steps. I know you do a lot of ballet. You you take lessons. People would be surprised to know that probably. But have you taken acting classes also? Um, not in the traditional way, but I, I have worked with a theater coach quite a bit um, over the course of my career. Uh, someone that understands like staging and, and who's not a dancer, but understands the approach of, of getting an, a large audience to right. be able to understand the story you're telling through your body. Right. Uh, questions, other questions right over here. You want to stand up? And what's your name? Bess. Hi. I'm here with a Hi. bunch of young girls. Hi. Um, I was wondering what it's like to travel as much as you do and if you have a favorite city to perform in. Uh, do you um, ever get tired of it? Um, I love traveling. Even when I'm not traveling for work, I'm traveling mm -hmm. to go to a beach somewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, it's such a big part of, of American Ballet Theater. Like that's what we do. We're a touring company, so um, it's it can be difficult if you're you're going somewhere really far and then you only have a day to adjust and then you're on stage and you're like, I don't know where I am or what time it is and what my body is going to do because I feel like I have no control over it. Um, I think. Uh, 
Asia, going to Asia is probably one of my favorite places. Um, being in Tokyo, um, they have the most incredible ballet fans there. Um, they're very respectful and very quiet and reserved when they're in the theater. So you may not think they're enjoying themselves as much as they are, but when you leave the, the theater and you see just thousands of them waiting for you outside and chasing down the tour bus, you feel like you're Justin Bieber or something. <laughs> It's, I can imagine. Um, do we have any aspiring ballerinas out there who want to ask a question of Misty? Okay, stand up. What's your name? <laughs> yeah, she's ready to perform. Okay. <laughs> My your... name is Sage. Hi, Sage. And um, I'm interested in doing ballet, but I also like other dance forms. So it, should I like just focus on ballet or also do the other dance forms? I like focus that on that. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think that ballet is definitely a tool that will help you in every um, genre of dance that you enjoy. It's something that's going to make you better. So I think that ballet is something that you should have, but it's important for you to find what you love. And to me, that's, that's like most important, not to just do something just because you think you have to do it or someone's telling you to do it, but that you really find what you're passionate about. So I say keep doing it all until you find the one that you love. Yeah, you, there's so much concentration to what you do. Also, people, you know, may not know, but you hours and hours just perfecting every motion and every movement. It's got to. I mean, for most of us, ADD is like <laughs> second nature. You're not allowed to have ADD. <laughs> yeah, um, the I mean, the amount of uh, focus and, and sacrifice and dedication is, is it's incredible, really, when you think of all the years that you, we put into yeah. um, getting to this point. But um, you have to be focused for eight hours a day, um, you know, and, and really paying attention. Um, anyone else out there? Yes, right here. so everybody else can hear you. Yeah. Just curious, in addition to the dance training every day and the food, how you take care of your body, is there, is there, are there other forms of training that you do besides the dance lessons and the dance performances, yeah. like weightlifting and that kind of aerobics? Definitely not weightlifting, but <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's, it's such a critical thing for a professional athlete, period, that what we do dancing and rehearsing every day isn't enough. Um, it's important to do cross training um, and strengthen your muscles in a way that you can't really get from dancing. Um, when you're in rehearsal, you're not thinking of working symmetrically. You, the movement and choreography doesn't always allow for that. So it's not like being in a gym and, and you know doing certain amount of exercises on one side and then you do the same thing on the other side and you're really strengthening certain muscle groups. Um, I do a lot of gyrotonics, Pilates, swimming. I'll do cardio on the elliptical machine, um, work with kind of like personal trainers that will adapt certain uh, exercises to strengthen like specific parts of my body that are weaker. What, where do you get that energy? It's amazing. You know, you talk about it in your book. The foods that you eat are very important. You also meditate, which helps give you that, <laughs> that spunk, that vibration that allows you to move forward. Yeah, um, I think that it's, it's, I, I understand how difficult it can be to get out of bed in the morning and, and work out and exercise, but my experience is that the moment I do that, I have more energy to do more. And so it's something that I have to remind myself that I'm going to feel better after I do this, and it gives you more energy. That's great. Uh, right here. Good evening. I just had a question. Um, I'm Lynn Marie. I just had a question regarding your recent appearance on World of Dance. You were a judge. How do you feel about those competition type shows now? Obviously, they weren't around when you know we were growing up, or when you. I'm just curious. I mean, there's a lot of talent there, but what do you think of that reality type TV? 
and how did you like the experience? Um, I think the most positive part of those shows is the exposure to America, that it's reaching, it's, it's you know, the average person who maybe has, has never been exposed to dance in any way is they can turn on their television and, and discover um, something that they maybe were never exposed to. And I think that's incredible, especially necessary right now in, in, in the United States for us to be able to turn on our TV and see um, arts in that way. Uh, it was a really great experience. I did a lot of um, a lot of judging on So You Think You Could Dance a couple of years back, so I have experience of doing that. Um, and this was a really, really nice kind of comforting experience of having these all, you know, the other guest judges that, or the other judges that are professional performers and, and have, you know, real dance backgrounds. So it felt really genuine um, to be up there and that they really understood uh, the dancers that were on stage and were really supportive of all of them. That's great. Um, over here, we saw a little, someone, there you go. <laughs> Do you want to stand? I'm Emma. I was just wondering what other styles of dance do you like other than ballet? <laughs> um, I don't have like a lot of time to see other genres, so it's hard to even know what's going on out there. Um, but being on um, World of Dance, there are, have you been watching it at all? No, okay. Well, there are, there are two twins um, called Lay Twins, and they work with Beyonce. I don't know, the two guys. Whatever it is they're doing is pretty cool. I don't even know what it's called, but. <laughs> <laughs> gymnastics. Well, you used to do gymnastics, right? When no, you no, I when never you were did little? it. I, I taught myself things, because oh. I was really infatuated with um, seeing the Olympics and everything, but I never, it Nadia Coleman each? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, over here? There you go. Um, how did you get through the time when people didn't support you to keep dancing? Sorry, I didn't. How did you get through the time when people didn't support you to keep dancing and keep doing what you love? I wanted to know how did you get the people to support you? I know like your mom didn't support you at some point when you were growing up to keep doing ballet. And how did you get through that time? Um, I wouldn't say that she didn't support me. I think that it was just a really difficult, um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's really important for families that are experiencing raising a dancer to understand what they're going through. And I don't, didn't come from a family that knew anything about the ballet world and, and how much it really took to be a part of it, that it's not just me, it's my family as well that's really investing so much time in, in, um, in training, and so I think that it was me understanding a balance of being able to be home and spend time with my family and getting the training that I needed to during the week, so it's just in, uh, figuring that out. Yeah. Um, another hand, there you go, over here. Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm gonna just pass it, okay? There we go. And when the mic gets to you, first question, what's your name? Um, Maya. <laughs> Hi. 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 Maya. And I was just wondering if, what would be your favorite show that you have done? Um, my favorite show. I really enjoyed performing in Whipped Cream this past season. I don't know if anyone came to any of the... <laughs> <laughs> wow, um, a lot of fans here. <laughs> it was just so... Um, fantastical and over the top and um, just like a dream for a child to to see a show like that that was just so much fun and full of life and sweets and <laughs> that's great um, all the way in the back over here on the left hi I'm Kelly and I have two daughters that very much admire you so we're grateful you're here thank, thank you, you. And I'm wanting to just come back to your point about focus and determination. And I'm really curious where your mind goes when you are on stage, when it isn't out there maybe like it was in Paris, but when <laughs> the other times. Um, I feel like I'm so just kind of 
in the moment and so present with what I'm doing that I'm truly believing that I am that character mm -hmm. and living in that moment as that character um, whenever I'm on stage. I think that's really important for me to not get kind of removed from what I'm doing and start judging myself or thinking like, well, what are they thinking or what are they judging me for and what could go wrong? And so it's so easy to step, to slide into that place, um, which for a performer is a really horrible place to go. So it's it's just important. And I think working with a theater coach and, and, and doing exercises and things like that, it it's helped me to um, be able to stay really present. That's great. And once the performance is over, do you have a little letdown? Um, you know, like, okay, it's over, now what? Or it, your energy level shifts. So I would imagine that for your your emotional level shifts. For most performers, you stay on a high for a while. And yeah. so it's hard to get to bed at night, which is really <laughs> difficult when you're in season and you're right. like, I gotta get up and do this all over <laughs> but again. I, go like, dance I gotta again. <laughs> I have to like get some rest. Right. So that's that's probably the most difficult part is, yeah. is finding a way to like settle down and, and, and come down so you can get rest and, yeah. and your body can heal. Yes. How do you, do you meditate at night? Is that how you help yourself do that? Um, I don't do any formal um, meditation at all, but I definitely, um, I, I breathe and things like that before yes. I go on stage and and at night I like to like listen to sometimes I'll listen to meditation like mm -hmm. someone speaking um, but I like to listen to like certain types of music that help me to go to bed just to like calm yeah. down that's great um, over here um, I, hi um, I'm Sadie um, I, hi. Just I just wondered um what is your um, most difficult move in the Firebird? Oh, oh, good question. <laughs> um, all of it. <laughs> it's, um, I think that the most difficult part of Firebird is the, um, the length of time that you're dancing um, with such high energy that a lot of the ballets that I've been doing over the course of my career, you find ways of pacing yourself so it's not as exhausting. And Firebird is not one of them. There's no way around it. It's just so physical and so um, high energy and so demanding that there's not one rehearsal or one performance that I've done where I didn't leave the stage and literally just fall on my back and have to lay there for five minutes and gather myself because it's so difficult. <laughs> Did you ever um, make a misstep in that one? Because it is so, it's like vibrational, right? Um, there are steps that you don't always execute the way yeah. you want to. <laughs> but they yes, look perfect to the audience, so it's all I think okay. it's a little easier to get away with in something like Firebird yeah. because she's so frantic and, right. and, um, and it's more about the character. It's not, you know, this attention to like every step every that step, I do. Yeah, that's great. Um, yes, right over here. Yes, you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. There you Hi, go. Misty. This is a really big night for, for the little ballerinas in the audience. Um, I wanted to introduce you to my little daughter, Nola, who, who is going to be attending um, ABT's Summer Intensive. Wow, and our question for you is, uh, it's her first one, so we're really excited. And I guess our question for you is, will you be popping in? Will you be there? Will you be around? When is it? It's, <laughs> it's, um, it starts on the 31st of July, and it'll be there for the first two weeks. So. Oh, I don't think I will be here. Okay. So. We just <laughs> next time. Yeah, a we lot of the dancers aren't around during that during that time. This is so exciting, though. Our, the summer intensives are so critical and so important. I think for a young dancer in in the kind of process of becoming a professional. So you're gonna love it. Yeah, thank you. Valuable information there, right? Over here in the green or white shirt. <laughs> uh, hi, Missy. My name is Charles. Um, I wanted to ask, as a ballerina with one of the biggest platforms, do you feel held to a higher standard? And how do you balance your focus between your professional work versus you know other interests and causes that you believe in? Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've learned to 
always put my career first uh, in my, my dancing career. Um, that's why I have the platform that I have. And so to me, that's most important with keeping up with my training, um, being rested and, and being able to give the best performance that I can. Um, yeah, it can be difficult sometimes when people assume that because I'm, I'm put out there and I'm given the opportunity that I am to represent the ballet world that I'm the best and I'm the first person to tell people that I'm not here and on this stage and, and with a voice that I have because I'm the best. Um, I'm here because I'm representing uh, so many people that feel they can relate to me, that have been told no, that um, come from an underprivileged community, that are a minority, and I feel like that to me is so powerful and all I can do is just try and be my best self and the best dancer that I can be, but it's not you know, me trying to take over the ballet world, but bring the ballet world with me on all of these amazing stages and incredible platforms. Well said. Okay, okay. just a few more questions right over here. My name's Karina, and I was wondering, who do you look up to? Um, it's hard right now. I mean, dancer-wise, Paloma Herrera was such a big part of my, um, like my adolescence uh, when I first started dancing. Um, Julie Kent, all of them are gone now. And it's like, I'm like one of the senior ballerinas and I'm like, what's happening here? <laughs> Amazing, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have dancers in the company that are, it's, it's incredible to be in a company with so much talent and to just be able to like, pop your head into a rehearsal and, and be inspired and steal things from people and like, oh, I like how she did that. I'm gonna take that and use that. Um, but Isabella Boylston, Hiseo, um, Stella Obrera, all, I mean, there's so many dancers in the company that, that I find inspiring. Terrific. Um, right over here. There you go. And what's your name? Hi, um, I'm Sedona. And do you have a ballet that you really want to be in that you haven't been in before? Um, I feel like I've done so many. I'm so grateful <laughs> for all of the um, amazing roles I've been given the opportunity to do. I think maybe um, Manon, to do the lead in Manon, because it's very dramatic, and I love that. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say some prayers there. In the back over here. Hi, my name is Ree, Hi. Um, and I was wondering when you first started ballet, did you have any role models? Yeah, um, well Paloma Herrera I think was like the role model for me um, growing up, like having, seeing a dancer that was so gifted at such a young age and kind of put under such pressure, she joined ABT when she was like 16, and I think she was the principal dancer by the time she was 19, so I felt like I connected with her in a lot of ways, um, so she was a really big inspiration for me, role model. Over here, um, in the back over here. Uh, put your hand up again so she can, there you go, right here, on the left. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Tawara. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite thing that got you into doing ballet? My favorite. We didn't quite hear you. Your favorite thing that got you into doing ballet. Oh, my favorite thing, okay. So, I love listening to music, and from a young age, like that's what we did at home. We always had soul music on, and hip hop, and R&B, and so that's kind of like how I grew up, and I loved moving to it. So that was like my first introduction to dance, was turning on the TV, seeing a music video, or just in my head thinking like, what movement would work with this song? And I would just create, and I feel like that's how I, I kind of fell into ballet. Yeah. Um, uh, a few more, we're gonna take two or three more. Uh, over here, yes. Hold on. <laughs> right here on the aisle. All the way over here, yeah. You can yell if you'd like. <laughs> a very good question. Um, how did I balance dance with school and hanging out with friends? <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's a big sacrifice when you become a dancer, and if you want to be a professional, um, you know, I was taking up to three ballet classes a day on top of, you know, going to public school during the day. Uh, because I started so late, um, I had to get so much more training in during the day than most people do, and because it was such a short amount of time that I had to prepare. So I ended up taking a year off from school and doing independent study so that I could really work all day long in the studio. Um, but I sacrificed a ton of time spent with friends. And my, the dancers that I, that I was in the studio with became my best friends because that's who I was seeing every day. And, and, um, but it's, it's something that you have to really consider that um, it's such a critical time when you're at your age to get the right training and, and um, be really focused if you want to be a professional. How do you then balance your marriage with your career? Because you travel so much and you do so much. It seems easy. I mean, I don't know. It's Does he only come been with a year you since I've been married? But. Yeah. Oh, so he gets you. He understands. My um, wife's not going to be here from yeah, seven no. to what midnight. Yeah. I think it's about having a partner who understands the sacrifices Absolutely. you have to make to do what you do. What you, what your life's desire is, and right. what your calling is. Um, anyone else? Right over here. Here you go. Where is your like favorite place to dance? Well, Tokyo is definitely one of my favorite audiences. Um, Greece, Italy. Um, Can you <laughs> imagine having this life dancing all over the world on these big stages? It's really it's, incredible. Yeah. yeah, what a blessing. Yeah, so all the way in the back over there on the aisle. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering, not that you have to choose, but maybe... Who's your favorite partner that you dance with oh, at ABT? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, there's too many. Um, Top two. Marcelo Gomez and Herman Cornejo. There you go. All right. Uh, why? Um, they're, Hello. They're, oh, OK. Hello. <laughs> well, they're amazing. They're gorgeous. They're strong. Yeah. All right. Right over here. Hello. Hi. Hi. How you spin in ballet? How you? How do you what? Spin. spin. How do you spin? Well, it's really important to learn how to spot. That way, you don't get dizzy and fall over. So you find one spot to look at, and you whip your head around, and you find it again, and you keep doing that, and that's how you can spin in one place over and over again. Good tip. You're gonna do that <laughs> later tonight. <laughs> All right. Uh, right here. We'll take one and then the next. There you go. What's your name? Hi, my name is Remy. And how many ballets have you been in? Oh, I never counted. Um, <laughs> I God, I don't know, 50 maybe something wow. like that. It's been a lot. <laughs> and um, do you have any like favorite costumes you like to wear in your shows? Good question. Yeah, I do. Um, I think one of my favorites um, is from the ballet La Bayadere. Um, it's set in India, so it has like a lot of really rich colors, golds and burgundies, and um, it's really beautiful. That's great. Uh, back here on the aisle in the white, straight up. <laughs> Hello. What are three of your favorite pieces of music, maybe one of them also being one that you listen to to go to sleep at night that you talked about? Um, hmm. Let's see. There's some Tchaikovsky that's, that's not super traditional that you um, would hear, like Swan Lake or something, but um, gosh, I don't know. I don't really listen to classical music outside of my job. <laughs> um, I, I love I love soul music and R and B. Like I grew yeah. up on Aretha Franklin and Sade. Yay! And Anita Thank Baker you. and. <laughs> All right, who's going to get the lucky last question? Oh, back there we have a few. We're going to take a few back there because we've missed you. What's your name? Um, Maya, and I was wondering how many point shoes have you gone through, and do you keep them? could not tell you how many I've gone through. Um, I go through uh, <laughs> 10 a week. Wow. And no, I do not keep them. I sign them and 
we ABT sells them. <laughs> That's great. We're making a lot of money, I'm sure. Um, there was somebody else next to you or near you back there? Uh, oh, the whole, you had a group question. Okay. Um, right over here? Do you want to just stand? Okay. You can yell. <laughs> Hi, I know you um, have written these books, and I'm just wondering if you've always wanted to be a writer, or if that was a side something dream, or how what compelled you to become right. a writer. Um, so, being so shy when I was younger, um, I I would write in journals, and I still have every single one of them to this day. I have every diary and every journal that I've ever written in since I was, I think, 15 years old. Um, before I I really understood and learned to have a voice outside of, you know, using my body to express myself. Um, writing was just so cathartic to me. And um, I don't think that I ever thought I would write a book, though. But I really enjoyed that the process. And so I w when I was approached to write my memoir, I was like, oh, I've got a lot of material here on my bookshelf of every <laughs> journal. There you go. That's great. And your newest book is called Ballerina Body, Dancing and Eating Your Way to a Leaner, Stronger, and More Graceful You. We wish we could all be as lovely, beautiful, interesting, and personable as you are. And how amazing is it for all of us to be able to have this conversation with Misty Copeland? Thank, Thank you. you so much for your Thank time. you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And before you leave, we have one more thing. Come on, let's give Misty a hand. Let's give Misty another hand. Wow. You are amazing, amazing and inspiring. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Misty, for coming out to be with us today. It's important for you to come out and to speak. And I heard you when you were speaking, and you spoke to, I don't know if you realized it, but you spoke to our little ones that are here and let them know that you're the first. And a lot of times at the center, we like to bring individuals that look like us so that they can see what they can become and what they can be. And you are a living testimony and you don't know the impact and the value of just being here and seeing you and what you have done means to those that are out here, especially our little ones in the audience here. Thank you so, Thank you so very much. much. To show our thanks, because there's not enough that we can say or do, um, I, we have a special treat for you. And I'm going to introduce Ms. Nika Milburn, who is the Assistant Director of Women's and African American Affairs from Governor Cuomo's office. She's here, and she has a word to say. Let's give her a hand. Yay. I don't think, okay. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here with you tonight and to present this citation on behalf of Governor Andrew Cuomo. I'm not going to read the whole thing. As you can see, it's very long, but I do want to read a few lines to you. Whereas this evening, Misty has come to Long Island to be part of the Thinking Forward Lecture Series presented by the Bridgehampton Child Care and Recreational Center with the Eastern Long Island NAACP with an inspirational discussion of her life and accomplishments Generous with her time and talents, Misty is motivated to help create new possibilities and opportunities for the many young black dancers who see themselves in her. Now, therefore, I, Governor Andrew M. Cuomo of the state of New York, do hereby confer this special citation upon Misty Copeland in recognition of her compassionate outreach, her professional achievements, and the remarkable body of work which is grateful Ballet loving public will forever continue to enjoy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That's great. Isn't that beautiful? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Very deserving, most deserving. And now, the Bridgehampton Child Care, we call us, us the center kids and the community. We also have something that we have here for you. 
We know at the ballet, usually when you're in your ballet, usually they come out and they give you a bouquet. So now we have the center bouquet. And we have some of our center teams here and some of our other community individuals. We want to come up and we want to say thank you. That's true. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Oh. And did you, you guys? <laughs> they don't want to leave. Stars are born. <laughs> and did you see the Cheez-Its? Yep, we gave Misty Cheez-Its. <laughs> wow. Okay, so thank you all for coming out again. We want to thank you. And these are the, this is what lecture series is about. And we, we will have, be having more lecture series. We have some of our um, lecture series, others that have been with us. So stay tuned, check our website. Um, we do have some up and coming events. For those of you, I heard Missy say that she loves music. Well, if you love music on July the 29th, we're gonna be having an event with the Earth, Wind and Fire tribute band, all of the Earth, Wind and Fire um, fans out there. We're also gonna be having a golf outing at the Atlantic on October the 2nd. So stop by and meet us there. But we also want you to remember, we also have a special treat for you. We have, we want you to pick up Misty's signed books in the lobby. Thank you to Book Hampton. Thank you, Gilda Squires. Thank you, Gilda. <laughs> Thank you, Misty. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you everyone for coming out. Good night. Peace and blessings to you.